It gives you unity, particularly if everyone knows the, the music, if everyone knows the words. I just wanted to say one other thing about King before we turn to LBJ's speech. Like many um, wonderful leaders, there is in King a prophetic streak. And he is very well aware of this, very conscious of it. Uh, at Memphis, during the sanitation workers' strike in 1968, one of the last things that King says are, I've been to the mountaintop, I, meaning himself. There's no we here. He's allowed me to go to the mountaintop. And I've looked over and seen the promised land. I may not get there, but we as a people will get to the promised land. And then I'm not worried. A remarkable sentence. I'm not fearing any man. He's shot very shortly after this. He's assassinated very shortly after this. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He hath trampled out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. All know that as a line from Battle. Battle Hymn of the Republic. Yes, Battle Hymn of the Republic. Well, what is this image of? What figure is he acting as a memory or echo of? Moses, Moses. yes, it's the figure of Moses. It's the figure of Moses who did not get to the Promised Land. If you've read The Grapes of Wrath by Steinbeck, you know that they leave Oklahoma and they're going to California, which is for them the promised land. But one of their party doesn't get there. I think it's a grandpa, is that right? Well, there's a kind of prophetic figure to that. There is going to be someone who gets you there, but who doesn't him or herself get there, which indicates the temporal aspect of this struggle. It's not over, and King knows it's not over. Now, let's turn to Johnson's Voting Rights Act speech. And I want to ask you a direct question about it. Have you all had a chance to read it? Take a look at it? Got to take a look at these texts before we start. That's important. A not insignificant part of this speech is devoted to an overt attempt to establish a certain ethos of the speaker. Where would you say that is in this address? What elements of this address is it in which Johnson is self-consciously concerned with presenting himself as an ethical individual involved in this whole matter? And then you have to ask whether it's successful or not. But There's an entire paragraph where he starts every sentence, I want to be the president who, and then fills in these goals that he has that he wants people to see him as. Yes, and how about his own personal history? Is that mentioned in this address? Um, he talks about having sprung from South and how he's grown up uh, exposed to a lot of racial issues. Yes, not only that, he's quite specific about his teaching and about the children he's taught. In other words, he's putting himself forward here as someone who has had a personal and direct experience in all of this. And there may be some truth to the notion that politically, it might have been a Southerner who could have done this in a way that a Northerner might not have been able to do this. Johnson was also pretty good at twisting arms and making deals. But nevertheless, and he presents himself with this ethos. So if you look through this speech, you'll see too that Johnson calls on history. He calls on experience. He says basically history and experience tell us that in order to get what we think is right and just, what we have now is insufficient. It hasn't worked. And he's saying that's obvious. So if it hasn't worked, what is needed? This bill is needed. This law is needed. He's got to convince people that what's on the books is not sufficient. So that's why in this address, he is not afraid to say at a couple junctures and it's a claim, but he's not afraid to say that in support of the destiny of democracy and the dignity of man's experience has clearly shown that the existing process of law cannot overcome systematic and ingenious discrimination. How does that word ingenious? 
What does he mean by ingenious discrimination? It's a positive word yoked to here a negative quality. What is ingenious discrimination? Uh, to me, it sort of implies that there's uh, like a premeditation or a thought. Yeah, a, a kind of a hidden premeditative uh, mode of discrimination, which is very difficult to root out and which current laws have been unsuccessful in approaching. In other words, people have put a lot of thought in how to discriminate. They put a lot of thought into poll taxes or literacy tests, or they put a lot of thought in how to order what congressional district lines are drawn. They put a lot of thought into various things that will cause discrimination. So he comes back to that again a little later in the speech and says, experience has plainly shown that this is the only path to carry out the command of the Constitution, a congressional action, passing a law. And then farther along on page 262, after what I consider to be a kind of counter argument, where he says, this is no moral issue, there is no issue of states' rights, there's no constitutional issue here. These are all statements of opposition to the arguments that have been raised about not passing this law. Then he echoes the song of many marchers and protesters, and we shall overcome. As a man whose roots go deeply into southern soil, I know how agonizing racial feelings are. Then he says, I want to be the president who educated young children to the wonders of the world. But this is after he talks about his first job. It was a college teacher in Catula, Texas, in a small Mexican-American school. Few of them could speak English, and I couldn't speak much Spanish. My students were poor, and they often came to class without breakfast. So in a sense, Johnson is putting himself forward. Now, this is risky. I warn you, it's risky to put yourself forward as an example. Johnson may be more safely doing it here. Why? Because he really knows this legislation by this time is sort of in the bag, and it's going to happen. And he can say this. So it's a risky proposition to say I and my and put that forward. It's so risky that, in fact, there were other times in Johnson's administration where I think it backfired on him, because I can remember him myself in my own memory, getting up in front of various charts and saying, my helicopters and my ships, talking about Vietnam. And it was a somewhat sad history as the country got deeper and deeper into Vietnam with a president describing all of this, with more and more individuals going to Vietnam, many of them from the lower socioeconomic groups. One of the reasons why King was opposed to the Vietnam War, because you go to that memorial in Washington, D.C., and you read those names, and you know that a lot of those people had no college education and no college deferment, and a lot of them were people of color, and a lot of them didn't have very much money. It's certainly not true of all of them, but certainly true of a lot of them. Despite the fact there was a draft, because of deferments, because of other reasons, so on. So it's a tricky proposition to put himself forward, but he does put himself forward. Um, this is, in a way, an important punctuation mark for the entire civil rights movement, not to say that it has ended. I don't think, in this country, struggles like that really ever end. I honestly don't. That's why I think there's that phrase, in order to form a more perfect union. Meaning in order to form a better union. To make it better. When you look at John Quincy Adams' first lecture on rhetoric and oratory, and he makes that division between um, rhetoric as something which is theoretical and oratory which is practical, um, there are a couple of other things he says which I think uh, are important and I want to point them out before we end today. He says, the connection between genuine rhetoric and sound logic is indissoluble. In other words, really good rhetoric does not try to pull the wool over people's eyes. It doesn't try to short change on logic. It shouldn't do that. And he then talks about the peculiar utility of the art of rhetoric in the situation of this country. 
And he talks about the various professions. He talks about the pulpit teaching and the bar. And all of these lead Adams to, he's talking to students here in the college, to say this is something which is going to hold you in good stead. It's going to be something not just that's useful, but is useful for society. It makes a difference to speak well for society and to be honest about that and to be able to criticize the speaking of others and receive criticism of your own speaking. Is it messy? It is messy. Is there an absolute and perfect authoritative judge of it? No. Exactly not. Stephanie, right? Yes. No, there isn't. No one's going to be around to say this person did this and that person did that. What is the best judge of it? I would argue there is a judge of it. What is the best judge ultimately of all of this rhetorical practice? The audience, the audience and what's remembered. The audience at the time and history. The audience and history. And is that judgment rendered? Yes, it is rendered. History renders judgments. And they may be revised, but they will be rendered. And so as we look back on some of the things we studied here in part one, we see that those individuals have had a judgment of history in part rendered on them. And many of them, I would argue, those we've been looking at in this unit, were successful. And I would further argue that they were successful because they were courageous, they had a certain sense of virtue, and yes, because they did study rhetoric and cared about it.